it's so lovely um, to be able to come and bring God's word to you again this morning. Um, I just want to pray before we even open up the scriptures together and just to ask God to come and speak to us through his word today. Father, would you come and speak to us today, Lord, we pray. By your spirit, would you open up your word to us. Help us, Lord, Lord, not to just to be hearers, but doers of the word. Lord, would you speak into our lives? Would you speak into our hearts? Would you shape us and mould us for your glory? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read um, James 2, verses 14 to 26. And this scripture is a powerful scripture we're going to be um, going through today. And we're going to be doing it in two parts. I'm on holiday next week, um, so I'm going to record both messages this morning. Um, for you so you can listen through uh, both one part one and part two uh, this week and next week James 2 14 to 26 what good is it my brothers and sisters if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds can such faith save them suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food if one of you says to them Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but there's nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish person, you do, want, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited him credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend you see that the person is considered righteous by what they do not by faith alone in the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them on in a different sent them off in a different way in a different direction as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without deeds is dead before I go um, on any further I just want to thank those who have spoken um, for me in the past five weeks Um, I up until that point I'd preached 11 times in a row which I never do um, normally in any normal setting and even in crisis mode um, that was getting too much so I just want to thank um, Pastor Peter Rook, Pastor Ali Tuff, Pastor Adam Roseblade, Alan, um, our worship leader, and Lydia, my wife, and one of the church leaders um, who's preached um, for us in the last five weeks and has brought a fresh word, brought an encouraging word, brought a challenging word to us. Um, and just want to continue as we're looking into the study of James. What are we looking at? Why did we start this study during lockdown? I really believe that God placed this study on my heart because James is a fantastic book for us as believers to learn how to live our lives for Christ. That transformed life. Not just saying that we have faith, but actually putting that faith into action and living it out. I just want to do a quick recap on what we've looked at. Um, And I'm not going to go into any great detail because, you know what, you can look at these videos or our sermons that we've spoken on, on our Facebook page, on our YouTube channel, because they're all there for you. James 1, we've looked at the first two messages and they were titled Joy in the Coronavirus Trial and Listen and Do. James 2, we've looked at the last kind of parts of James, James 2 verses 1 to 13, in a four part kind of mini series within this series called no favorites just show mercy you know you can recap them and and rewatch them and my encouragement is that you do because we've had a bit of a break from the book of james 
Do you know, you can help us by liking the page. Like our Facebook page and get notifications when you um, when we're on, when we're posting something, when we're putting a video out, that'll be fantastic. Share the video on Facebook. Help us to spread the message wide. You know, we are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and the more people that hear it, the sooner I believe our Lord will return. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Do you know we've got over 400 people that like our page on Facebook, but yet have 30 subscribers to our YouTube channel. Please, please, please like our YouTube channel because all of our content before lockdown is all on our channel. Um, do you know what? I think we might even start posting some of our old videos um, on on Facebook Live just so we can um, we can just, you can see what we were doing before lockdown. And it's kind of brought us nicely into this final part of James two today. James is an incredible part of the book, and one of the most probably quoted scriptures from James is found in this final part. Of this chapter as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without deeds is dead and I'm gonna get onto that a little bit later in my sermon but today is an important day in my life we're speaking on Sunday um, it's actually uh, Thursday afternoon I'm recording this now but this is going out on Sunday and today this Sunday marks um, three years since I became the pastor of the church as I took over the leadership from my father-in-law and um, I just want to thank God for his faithfulness for holding us through for the last um, last three years his goodness and I think do you know what during these last 15 weeks of lockdown I believe right now that the church has a vital part to play in the life of the community more than ever. I believe this sermon called Faith Into Action actually helps us focus through what we've gone through the last 15 weeks and for us um, and for me especially as the church leader, as the pastor, celebrating three years um, this, this weekend, actually seeing what God has done in the last 15 weeks has helped me so much you know over the last 15 weeks as i've seen the church supporting and working and serving the community working and partnering alongside other agencies helping those in need it has been a huge blessing to me Do you know it showed me more than ever that the reason that i believe god has called me to be here in this place i believe that god told me to stay in Dorchester because there was a work that he called me and has prepared for me to do. Many watching might know the story of how that happened. Some of you might not. Some of you might be new to church, an online church. And if you know the story, then I apologise for telling it again. If you don't know the story, then listen so you, you remember it for, for future. But Four years ago in May, I was ordained as a minister for Assemblies of God, and a few week and literally a few days before um, I got my ordination, my father-in-law, who was the minister of this church, who preached for us five weeks ago, came round and said to me that he was retiring and he wanted me to take over the church, and I said, "That's lovely, but I've already agreed to go and look at another church," and he was surprised by my reaction. He was we were re re surprised by my response and I had already spoken to our regional leaders at the time and said this is the position that we find ourselves in, um, what, what churches are available. Because I really truly believed that as I was about to be ordained as a minister that God had called me to go into the ministry. Um, and so um, a few weeks after um, I was ordained and my certificate is somewhere here in the room. Um, I went to go and look at this church just outside Southampton. And in the natural, it was a tick, tick, tick exercise. It was, they've got that, they've got this, they've got something that, that resonates within me. And almost in that natural response as we drove home and we're thinking, Lydia and I were talking and questioning, 
Is this what God is calling us to do? We stopped and we prayed. And we said, Lord, you need to speak to us. And for a week we were praying and, and seeking God's face for direction in where he wanted us to go. And we both went away separately and, and prayed and came back together and said, God said something. God's told me something. And almost we were just sharing it and it was almost just in tandem as we were talking. We both felt God give us exactly the same phrase. He said, there's still a work for you to do in Dorchester. Until that time is up, you're not to go anywhere. And at that moment, the, the natural yes to all of the offer that that church had blew out the window because we needed to stay and serve God. We needed to stay and honour what God had said to us to, and we needed to do. Do you know, Pete Rook preached a few weeks ago here and then Lydia interviewed him on um, Father's Day a couple of weeks ago. And he shared within his um, interview about the foundation that his dad left for him in this place. And I want to publicly thank Pete and I've privately thanked him and I've said it before in the church service, probably without a video camera stuck in my face, but as church is online now and all of our messages are going out onto the interweb, Pete, I want to publicly thank you for the foundation that you left. And I want to thank you for that tough decision that you and Julia had to make when you decided to retire from church leadership because you don't ever retire from the ministry, hence why you preached five weeks ago for me but to step away from a church that you served in for over 40 years, to step away from your friends and your close brothers and sisters in Christ, to give me and Lydia the, the time and the space to put our stamp on things. Pete, I want to honour you for that and I want to thank you for that. A huge transition that you went through, you, you said in your interview, a couple of weeks ago and a huge sacrifice that you made to lay down a ministry that you did for so long it was hard enough anyway but as I've said to lay down friends and acquaintances and brothers and sisters that you've done life with Pete I want to honour you for that do you know one of my mentors during my ministry training said to me do you know when you take over the church the first two to three years is really going to be about building on the foundations that were left behind and ironing out some of those little creases. Preparing for the real shift of change to happen between years three and years five have taken over. We've just entered into today, year three. And I'm expecting and hoping and believing for real shift, real momentum in the next few years. It's almost like we've planted the seeds for the last three years and building on the foundation that was left with John, with Pete, and seeing it grow now. I believe as we enter into the next two years of growth and change, I'm excited for what's around the corner. I don't know what the new normal looks like, but you know, I'm secure in the calling of God upon my life and for this chapter in Dorchester like I've never been before. In the natural, the other option was almost a better deal. In every area, it was better. But you know, when God speaks, we must listen and we must do, as we're told. I believe that God has anointed me and appointed me for this time. To quote from Esther, such a time as this. Do you know, as we've navigated our way through online church and how we've embraced the ever-changing coronavirus crisis, as we start preparing to enter into whatever the new normal looks like, I'm confident in this one thing. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Whatever happens... We as a church will preach Jesus Christ and him crucified as Paul encourages us to do in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 1 to 5. 
and we will allow the Holy Spirit to demonstrate his power, I believe we will see our community grow. I believe we'll see our community become disciples of Christ. How encouraging was what Adam shared about the power of multiplication. If each one of us believes God for one person, in nine years, if each person that got saved believed another for another person within Dorchester, in nine years, our whole town, our whole surrounding villages would be saved for Jesus Christ. I believe we will see our prayer happen right before our eyes, that all the peoples within our community will praise you, O oh God. I believe that we are going to enter into an incredible time and it's my honour to lead you as your pastor. And I want to thank each and every one of you who has supported us for the last three years. We've had some ups and downs, we've had some highs and we've had some lows. But do you know what? It's my honour to serve God and to serve you. And my prayer is as we come out of coronavirus, as we come out of this lockdown and we step into whatever society looks like, whatever the community looks like, that actually as a church we are united together, that we stand together, that we grow together and that we will extend God's kingdom together for his glory in Jesus' name. Amen. James 2, 14 to 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. You know, when someone claims to have faith, what they may have is intellectual assent, agreement with a set of Christian teachings, and as such, this would be incomplete faith. True faith transforms our, condu our conduct as well as our thoughts. If our lives remain unchanged, we don't truly believe in the truths we claim to believe. Do you know, if we confess Jesus Christ as Lord, if we live lives that contradict that claim, we're not credible witnesses for him. Do you know, in the past 15 weeks, the whole world has been watching the church, how it responds. The whole world is watching, isn't it, at the moment. Every group that's meeting, every group that's gathering. We live in a beautiful part of the country. And as a, as a county, we've been in the news twice in the last four weeks for the most ridiculous reasons. Week 9 into lockdown, or week 10, and we saw the people jumping off Durdle Door. A couple of weeks ago we saw them at Bournemouth Beach, half a million people in Bournemouth Beach, an emergency was, was announced. The whole world is watching. The whole world is waiting, isn't it? Pouncing to criticise, to judge anyone who steps out of line. Church, we're being watched. As Christians, we're being watched, how we respond, how we act. Today, lots of churches are going to reopen the doors for settings to kind of have gatherings with the restrictions, with the guidelines that are in place. Lots of people are going to think that that's a fantastic thing to do. Others will have the opinion that it's not a wise thing to do. We will believe that we would be right to do so, but we made the decision not to because of the amount of restrictions that are in place. It doesn't allow everyone within our congregation to meet and gather together at the moment. And we want to include everyone in that celebration and coming back. But as Christians, we're being watched. Our families, our friends, our work colleagues. The world is looking for Christians to slip up and make mistakes. And guess what? We do. 
From time to time we get things wrong. We make mistakes. Most of it, most of us own up to our mistakes. Most of us apologise for what we've done wrong. Most of us come before God and repent and ask for forgiveness and for him to change our lives for his glory. Do you know we are all still human and works in progress, being changed, being transformed by Jesus. But what I believe James is making the point of this, he's saying is, how can you claim to be a Christian and your life doesn't even match up with the claim that you've made? I'm talking about people who claim to be Christian and live a lifestyle so far removed from a Christian life that you're left, you're left scratching your head, even wondering what sort of example that is setting. And you know, the honest and brutal answer is this. It's leaving such a poor example that it's turning people away from Christ. That when people see Christians living worse lives than non-believers, why would they want to be part of that? Why would they want to be part of that church that that Christian claims to represent? All of a sudden, all the faithful work of a stable, faithful man or woman of God, serving him, shining the light in the darkness, gets destroyed by that one person who claims to live for Christ and actually they're living against him more than they are for him. In my short time of serving here as the pastor, I actually served as the associate under my father-in-law for a few years and was part of the leadership team. And I've been a Christian for 20 years now and been involved around church leadership in various roles for quite a long time of that. And I've seen some shocking displays of being credible witnesses for Christ. Do you know my prayer, my intention is not to offend or to embarrass anyone. I won't be mentioning anyone's names. But my intention is to draw on the experiences that I've gone through and highlight some of the areas I've mentioned as a warning to us. Do you know I've seen people who have claimed to live a life for Christ but yet would be happy to get drunk and drive in, in a car? A bad decision to drink and drive could cause or lead an accident which could kill someone and do you know what it is it's years of hurt that they tried to cover up by drink instead of talking to someone about it hiding it and that one mistake that they made caused so much pain i've experienced people who claim to be christian uh, who are happy living a life of abusing other people on any level of abuse, be that domestic, spiritual, emotional, financial abuse, just to name a few. As Christians, as men and women of God, do you know I've met people who think that it's acceptable and would even pick scriptures out of context to support what they're doing. Can I say right now that any form of abuse is absolutely wrong. Abuse at its core is injustice. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19 says this. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. Jeremiah twenty two thirteen. Woe to him who built his house on unrighteousness and his chambers by injustice. Who uses his neighbour's service out without wages and gives him nothing for his work. Any form of abuse is wrong. And to claim to be a man or woman of God and live that lifestyle goes against the Bible's teaching of how to live a Christian life. Do you know, I've seen people who post things on social media and I'm thinking, 
Weren't they in church on Sunday, worshipping God? Or the political party or the bias that they have? Or their attitudes towards others? And the hot topic in the past few weeks around racism. And if your response that when people say black lives matters is all lives matters, then let me just remind you this scripture of Galatians 3, 26 to 29. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourself with Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor their male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, you then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Get away from the black life political bias. But actually what they are suffering at the moment is wrong. And what injustice is happening is wrong. And let me just say that, do you know what? We're not immune from failure as believers. We are all just one bad decision away from undoing years of trust, of hard work, of respect, of credibility. But the harsh reality is that I believe it's a build-up of poor choices, poor understanding of God's word, that when that one big bad decision actually happens, I believe that actually if pastoral care was put in months, if not years before, it wouldn't have happened. I believe that if people shared their issues rather than hiding it from the church and asked for help, and ask for counselling, and ask for wisdom, and ask for guidance, that they wouldn't find themselves in the situations that they did. Do you know we're told in the Bible to bear with one another, to share in the hurt and the tough times. People who hide their pain or issues and don't want the church to know, do you know they're the ones that, when it goes wrong, they're first to complain that the church wasn't there or didn't do enough. I don't know where you're at. I don't know where your lifestyle is at. I know that we're all works in progress, but I know that our lives need to reflect the one that we're living for. Jesus was never a racist. He would never tr mistreat women. He would never mistreat children. So straight away by those three statements that I've just made, if you're racist, if you abuse people and you mistreat children, then you're going against the Bible because Jesus Christ himself is the word of God and he won't con contradict himself. This scripture, I believe, will help us. Colossians 3, 12 to 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all of these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all for the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let our lives reflect the one that we're living for. What good is it? Faith without action is dead. Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by 
itself is not a comfort we in the same way faith by itself if not accompanied by action is dead do you know the bible says without faith it is impossible to please god hebrews 11 verse 6 for he who comes to god must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him but it goes on to say in the following verses from 7 to 20 to 12 but by faith Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen moved with godly fear prepared an ark for saving the saving of his household which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness which was according to the faith by faith Noah built an ark by faith Abraham when he was called to go out to the place in which he would receive an inheritance he went out not knowing where he was going by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in foreign is in a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob the heirs with him of the same promise for he waited for the city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God Abraham stepped out into new territory by faith it goes on to say, by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive, to conceive the seed. And she bore a child when she was past at the age, because she judged him faithfully who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him, as good as dead, were born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, in innumerable, innumerable, as the sand by the seashore by faith sarah received her miracle faith in action do you know when we see the homeless or the vulnerable or the lost and the lonely and we pray lord help them we have to be moved into faith and action maybe in some way we are part of the answer to that prayer Maybe when we see the lost and the hurt and the broken and the lonely and we say, Lord, would you reach out and touch them? God is waiting for us to reach out our hand on his behalf and touch them. Faith in action. Faith in action in doing what God has called us to do. Do you know when Jesus says, lay your hands on the sick and they will be made well. We're not praying and, and not putting our hands out and touching people. We're praying, believing by faith that his word is true. And when we do what he says it can do, God will do what he can do. The impossible. James 6. Sorry, James 2, 16 to 17. If one of you says to them go in peace keep warm and well fed but does nothing about their physical need what good is it in the same way faith by itself if not accompanied by action is dead we cannot earn our salvation through deeds and actions we cannot earn salvation through works and doing good we cannot be saved by just serving and obeying god However, those actions should show that our commitment to God is real. Deeds of loving service are no substitute for, but rather a verification of our faith in Christ. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. As I wrap up the first part of this message, I want to remind us that true faith involves a commitment of your whole self to God. Faith and deed should go hand in hand. They should complement each other. They shouldn't be at war against each other. Let's pray. And I believe that by faith, God will shape our lives, mould our lives to reflect the glory of his name. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come and we ask, Lord, that you would shape us and mould us for your glory. Lord, that you would do a work in us, Lord, that only you can do. Lord, help us live lives, Lord, that are transformed by your glory. Lord, as we live lives, Lord, that you would receive all the glory that you deserve. Lord, you've called us to be, Lord, carriers of your glory. You've called us, Lord, to to walk 
Lord, to bear your name. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to live the lives that would do that. Lord, I pray in areas, Lord, where we have prejudice, where we have areas, Lord, that need dealing with. Lord, I pray that right now, Lord, you would speak into those areas. Lord, I pray, Lord, against racism. Lord, I pray against abuse. Lord, I pray against, Father, things in our lives, Lord, that contradict your word. Lord, I pray for those areas in our lives, Lord, that don't reflect you well at all. Lord, that you would deal with them in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray, Lord, that our lives would be credible witnesses for you. Lord, that you would be able to, to select us like you did to Job. When you said to Satan, consider my servant, Job, Lord, because you know and you knew, Lord, that he wouldn't turn his back on you. Lord, I pray, help us to live lives, Lord, worthy for your calling in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. The second part of this message is going to come next week. If you have been blessed by this, and please send um, an email to prayer.thestorehouse at gmail.com. We'd love to pray with you. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, um, there's, um, there's lots of information on our Facebook page, on our website, of how you be, can become a Christian. Do you know, um, as a church, we've brought Bibles in preparation, believing by faith that people are going to make a commitment to Jesus. And we'd love to send you a Bible to help you on your journey, to help you um, find more, out more about Jesus, so to get into the Word of God. And as you do that, we believe by faith that you'll grow to be the disciples that Jesus has called you to be. Bless you guys. We'll see you next week.